Oh yeah, the black presence in, um, on TV has changed America forever. Let's start subtracting black from TV and then you tell me. Uh, think of TV without In Living Color. Think of Saturday Night Live without Eddie Murphy. Think of television without Flip Wilson. Let's start subtracting. Let's think of TV without Bill Cosby or Fat Albert and his boys. Think of uh, TV music without Quincy's theme, My Squad. The Bill Cosby Show. What are you going to do for us this evening? Are you going to sing or are you going to play the xylophone? Sanford and Son. Think of TV without Red Fox. Think of TV without George Jefferson. Think of TV without Good Times. And then what you got? You know, what do you got then? What do you got then? What do you got then? From the primitive rock crystal of yesterday's radio is the crystal ball of television, in which is visible a whole new era of communication. The first 50 years of television in black has been a sometimes strange dance of images across the TV screen. Stereotyped, sanitized, and sometimes idealized. Often examined for deeper meaning than just entertainment, huh? black images on television change the performers and the viewers by illuminating the funny, dramatic, and musical soul of America. You wouldn't be able to talk about American culture without talking about many of these African-American figures. You couldn't talk about popular culture, in my mind, without talking about Louis Armstrong, for instance. You couldn't talk about the idea of being hip or cool without talking about Duke Ellington or Miles Davis. You know, so we have to recognize this. In the 30s and 40s, radio ruled the airwaves, and the excitement of hearing live bands, radio dramas, and comedies brought families together to sit and listen. Soon, it would be to gather and watch. There was no such thing as television. And radio, we'd sit around when I was a kid, and we'd listen to Amos and Andy, and we'd listen to these shows, and Beulah, and all these people were white because it was economical. They didn't want to hire blacks. You have to remember this. You will find that you are tuned in on today and focus on tomorrow. Go back when television was only black and white. Ask people of a certain age. They can pinpoint the very first person of color they saw on those tiny 12-inch screens. Hey, come in, come in quick. There's a black on TV. There's somebody black on television. When, when we would see any kind of black person doing anything on television, hey, here's one, come here, come here. Come here! Oh, it's gone. Oh, please, who was it? I don't know, it's too fast. I was really struck by William Marshall, uh, Lena Horne, Rochester. Life full of consequence, but who's scared of consequence? And of course, you know, we're talking of, and Ethel Waters. Am I blue? Ethel Waters and Louise Bieber's on the Beulah Show. And it was like a moment, of course, we all gathered around the TV because the Beulah Show was on. Beulah. Uh, and I think it might have been Louise Beavers who played her. Well, I like that. <laughs> Unforgettable. The first person of color that I saw on television was probably Nat King Cole. Little girl, you're the one girl for me, little girl. Nat Cole. My vivid recollection is Nat Cole, because he was like one of the only black guys. He was the only black guy on television. Pretend you're happy when you're blue. And uh, he did things that you just dreamt of doing. So the fact that he was there proved that you could do it. Just you, just me. Buckwheat <laughs> and. Uh, you know, from the Our Gang series, um, Little Rascals. Wow, I think we're going back to the days when the, you had to wait till that tube heated up for the <laughs> television to work. But I think my first memories of ever seeing blacks on television were the Little Rascals, Our Gang, with Buckwheat and Cotton and the little boy whose name was Stymie, who never said a word. He wore that hat and a suit. And what I later learned in life was that they edited out a lot of what he said because they felt that Stymie was too articulate. 
And I think that really had an impact on me as I got older and became a, a running her mouth kind of girl on TV that nobody would stymie me. <laughs> I'm not going to be stymied. And away we go! Sammy Davis Jr. And I think it was probably an appearance on a variety show. You know, it's such a thrill. I really mean this. And it's kind of an opportunity for me, too, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Sammy Davis Jr. was the first black cowboy on TV. Sammy Davis was, woo. I mean, when he was with the Will Maston Trio, you know, he and his dad and his uncle. This is the place where we first met. I saw them on Ed Sullivan for the first time. And he was awesome. I mean, you know, he did those. Uh, impressions. He danced and he sang. He was probably the most versatile, complete entertainer that I had ever seen. He was just wonderful. It was that image that cemented itself indelibly in my brain as a pattern for which I would then go on to pattern my own style of entertaining. By that I mean one who really did dramatic acting, really did the comedy, <laughs> really dance, who could really sing, and do it with the best in, that was considered to be the best in the business. Her second birthday, she's blowing out the candles on her cake. Esther Roll, good times. She was Florida Evans. And Morgan Freeman on the electric company. Oh boy, I remember, and I loved her too, uh, Diane Carroll, Julia, I mean, uh, I thought she was gorgeous. Network television, out of the laboratory and into your living room to provide the greatest medium of mass information and mass entertainment in the world. I did grow up on TV. I mean, as much as my parents would hate for me to say that, and I have very vivid memories of television. There's one incident that sticks out in my mind, and, and the caveat is, is I'll never know if it was a person of color, but it happened in the early 60s, and my mother and I were watching a television commercial, and there was a woman playing a housewife, and she was mopping the floor, and my mother and I looked at each other with that kind of knowing wink that, you know, she's black or she's a Negro. We were certain of it. I know the names of every black person that was on television between like 1950 uh, up to 1980 because these were all the marks, the benchmarks. You miss me, honey, when I'm far away. While the black image was first seen in variety shows, soon comedy inched its way from film, theater, and radio onto the television screen. All right, you can't say I never told you not. Leaving somebody here with all this stuff, I bet she gonna blame me for there's this old, uh, you know, black comedy tradition. Stephen Fetchett, in my mind, started it, you know. And you could even go back to Burt Williams and the whole minstrel tradition if you wanted to. You know, it's physical comedy. Eyes rolling, grinning. You know, as I like to say, people scratching when they don't itch, people laughing when things aren't funny. I think Burt Williams was in a cramp, you know. I mean, the average black person alive during the time of Burt Williams couldn't get a drink of water. You know what I'm saying? This dude's making a living, albeit in a, a very degrading manner, but he's making a living, and people know him, and he has recognition. But when he takes that face off, he's just another nigga, you know? And I'm sure he knew that, um, as well as the people around him. I mean, Rochester went through the same thing. Do I look as pale as I feel? Stephen Fetcher went through the same thing. Way along, stranger! You scare somebody stiff like that. I'm looking for hillbillies as you are. I ain't saying I am and I ain't saying I ain't. Well, that's close enough for me because I'm tired of walking myself. Stephen Fetcher 
had, you know, 22 cars and all these servants and fur coats and all. You, you know, people want to talk about bling bling. I'm like, go deal with Stefan Fetchett. He was the original uh, ghetto fabulous. But here's a guy who, when he goes home, and he's not going home to, you know, live next door to Jack Benny. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When he goes home, when he has to go back to, you know, where every other black person has to be, different story. It's really hard, you know, to go in front of all these white people and make them laugh by pandering to these racist stereotypes and then have to go home and look at yourself in the mirror. Um, or to then uh, be relegated to second class citizenry in the same way that every other black person at the time is relegated to being a second class citizen. So it's a bit of a disconnect. Yes, sir? I'll be gone for a little while. A Mr. Lindell will call. You take the message and be sure and get it right. Oh, yes, sir. At that particular time, Willie Best and uh, Ethel Waters. Can't forget your troubles when you're thinking what they are. And Louise Beavers. Never let the sea stop you from enjoying the watermelon. All right, if you've got a watermelon. You mustn't say that, Miss Mason. You've got your watermelon. But you choke yourself up on all them little seeds. I always say, spit them out. Spit them out for the taste of the melon. It was kind of like a small group of black folks that appeared over and over and over again in, in various films and television shows, and they were it. And, but at least we could see them on a regular basis on those television shows, and they weren't anyplace else. Mr. Evans, please. New York. Can you hear me? They weren't in commercials. You know, you just didn't see them anywhere else. And so whenever there was somebody black on TV, it's like everybody got called into the room, come on, you know, black folks. Of course, we didn't say black in those days. So come on, people on TV or meet girls on TV, whatever, you know. But we made sure we were going to go see it, you know. But baby, think it over. Uh, and it was a joy just to, it's like, wow, we're there. You know, we're there. And um, I don't think anybody said that at that time. It was really kind of more unspoken. And there was a pride, you know, that we were there and we were represented. Early TV was a gamble in any color. So risk takers turned to proven money makers. Hit radio shows like Beulah and Amos and Andy. TV's Beulah debuted in 1950. Three of Hollywood's favorite mammy actresses played the lead. Louise Beavers, Hattie McDaniel. This is Beulah, you all around gal. <laughs> I'm the same size all around. And Ethel Waters. Hi, Beulah. Beulah didn't seem to have a life of her own. She was the true stereotype. Happy, overweight, cheerfully solving the problems of the white family in her care. And don't you eat those cookies before you eat your sandwiches. I won't. I owe Rusty Levinson two plain and two raisins from yesterday, and I always like to pay my debts promptly. You know, it kept me in mind of this, this domestic, the woman who really took care of the household, you know, so it gave me an image of, of the black woman as a person who actually took care of the household and was a smart woman who, again, who answered a lot of questions that needed to be answered in, in that particular household. Beulah was too offensive, said image-aware watchdog groups. Their protests forced the network to cancel the series. You know, Beulah, I think that dress needs a pin or something. Let me get you mine. Oh, no, Miss Alice. I don't want to wear your good jewelry. Oh, don't be silly. It's just costume stuff. I'll get it for you. Oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> the most listened to radio show of the 30s and 40s took place in an all-black world of Amos and Andy. Most of the cast was black. But series creators, Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell, were not. Can I have a level now, please? Okay, Mike. Andy's right here like this. Andy say, uh, who scared me? Ha, ha, ha. A little. Mr. Gosden, may I have a check from you now, please, sir? And then uh, we have Amos. Amos about here, Mike. Uh, how's the balance on Amos? So for television, they began a long search for black actors to play the title roles. This fellow, Spencer Williams, actually comes to life as Andrew H. Brown. And I venture to say 
that three or four seconds after you see him, you will always think of him when you think of Andy. And to prove what I'm talking about, here he is, Andrew H. Brown. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and this next character we were a long time finding because the kingfish is really somebody. He's a fellow that has to have a twinkle in his eye, a smile on his face, and a sort of a devil in his heart. <laughs> a fellow who is always looking out after his brothers, but first and last after himself. <laughs> now, when this fellow comes out, and when he's on television, I think you'll realize that this really is the kingfish. In fact, we predict that all the characters we have, when you see them in the television film, they'll all come to life in front of your eyes. So, ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Tim Moore, the man that plays the part of George Stevens, Kingfish of the Lodge. Don't forget, we is all brothers in that great fraternity, the Mystic Knights of the Sea. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to thank our cast for coming down here and making this personal appearance so that you can meet them before you see them in the television show. So without further ado, we would like to say, let's put on the Amos and Andy show, and we hope you enjoy. Beginning in 1951, Amos and Andy brought laughter, scheming, and confusion into everyone's living rooms. It was wildly popular, but it made some African Americans uncomfortable. Kingfish, if you don't give me my money back, I'm going to punch you in each eye. Then I'm going to punch you in the mouth. Then I'm going to take a stick and crack your head. In other words, I'm going to open everything that's closed and close everything that's open. Our household didn't put that very high on the list of shows to be watched. It was um, mentionable that, or noteworthy that blacks were on television. And uh, that was a good thing. But that particular show we had to watch with a, a certain amount of reserve in, in my household. Amos, would you believe me if I told you I was doing this to keep our old friend Andy from going to jail? No. <laughs> well, when I want your opinion, I'll ask for it. I got a call from the producers of the show asking me would I play a part on the show. And I explained to him in no uncertain terms, I don't do that type of stereotype roles and you have the wrong person. And oh, I really, really went through it. Well, to make a long story short, I did the role because he showed me something then that they were doing on Amos and Andy that they're not doing today. And that was for Andy, you had a counterpart over here. For Andy, you had a, an attorney. Now, would you mind telling the court under just what circumstances you met the defendant? Well, about 18 years ago at a carnival, I reached in my pocket to get my wallet and shook hands with Mr. Stevens. <laughs> Good heavens! For Madam Queen, you had a nurse or a female doctor. Hello, folks. For Amos, who was a cab driver, uh, who appeared to be a clown, you had a psychiatrist. You had a counterpart to balance it out. I did, I think, four or five Amos and Andy shows, and I always played the part of a judge, a, a lawyer, a doctor, a college professor. Anybody who looks at Amos and Andy and thinks that this portrays black people is an idiot. You walk the streets, you see black doctors, you see black lawyers. If you go into an office building, we are not that. And it's obvious that we are not that. This is comedy. There's no Superman. Anybody who thinks or runs and jumps off a building thinking he could fly is just as stupid as that person who has that ideology about Amos and Andy. They are just funny characters. Uh, employing Ebonics before Ebonics ever came along. If this trouble's with my eyes, how come I got to take my pants off? That's a secret of obstricity. So don't argue with the obstricitor. If you look at it as it was, 
It was a TV show, a comedy, a sitcom, and that's all. I did like Amos and Andy. I did. And I'll tell you why. Because, yeah, you know, Kingfish was doing his schemes and all that stuff. However, hi, Kingfish. They were lawyers, they were cab drivers. It helped people to work at a time when there wasn't a lot of work. The NAACP urged CBS to develop programming that presented a black world not so stereotypical. Instead, the network chose to cancel Amos and Andy. The funny men went off the air and out on tour. I thought they were hilarious. And in fact, um, um, after, the, after the TV show, they went on the road and they had my mother play Sapphire on tour. So I got a chance to see them rehearse in my living room. And it was, it was, it was a gas. They were wonderful. Canceled or not, the series continued in syndication until 1966. It still sells briskly in VHS and DVD formats, leaving viewers safe at home to chuckle out loud at the Kingfish, Calhoun, and Sapphire. My daddy, who grew up in the South, which is where I'm from, he used to tell me about Amos and Andy. Never knew what he was talking about. Then they put out this video collection of Amos and Andy, and I watched it. And yes, I thought it was funny, especially for the time. You see this head here of mine? Well, there's a lot of ideas growing in this head. Well, if what's growing on the top is any sign of what's growing inside, it must be pretty bad. <laughs> Can you do that now? Should you? Eh, no. But was it funny, especially for the time? Yes, it was. It was ridiculous. It was very uh, uh, ripe, if I might, with satire. I, I think it's hilarious. Uh, people don't want to see that now, and rightfully so. Yeah, and I see here yeah, I no collateral, no co-signer. Well, I ain't got none of that stuff, so I in good shape there. <laughs> and I was quite pissed off at it when Amos and Andy was taken off of television. But we have certain organizations, when they run out of uh, uh, things to do, they lose jobs for us. Uh, at one time, they called it black exploitation. It was not black exploitation. It was black employment. Once again, Tarzan's war cry rings through the African jungle, a daring challenge to the ominous rhythm of battle drums. Uh, they griped about Tarzan. I didn't give a damn if a white boy took over the jungle. They hired lots of black people. I don't care if they ooga booga all the way across Warner Brothers or whoever filmed Tarzan, but I was happy to see a bunch of black people working. Appearances on religious or cultural programs seemed to fly under the radar of the watchdog groups. Lamp unto my feet, look up and live, a woman named Pamela Eilert was a producer. We would have, you know, music composed, I mean, for those, for those ballets, that, which were based on the Bible. So I've, got, I've done all the ladies from Mary to Bathsheba and the Witch of Endor and all those great ladies, you know, <laughs> it was great fun. 50s television included variety shows, which occasionally featured black entertainers, Duke Ellington. Cab Calloway. Now here's a very entrancing phrase. It will put you in a day. Paul Robeson. You have just had an audience with the Emperor Jones. Ella Fitzgerald. Sweet, sweet, but be discreet. Right. Sarah Vaughn and others appeared on shows with veteran white hosts such as Ed Sullivan, Milton Burrow, and Steve Allen. Ray Charles and Mahalia Jackson both had regional TV shows, but the first national show was hosted by Nat King Cole and featured both white and black entertainers, from Pearl Bailey to George Shearing. It was a great source of pride for African-American viewers. Thank you very much, and thanks for being with us again. This next song I like to do is moving up very rapidly on the popular chart. I'll put a ring around my rosy. Billy Daniels, the band leader, 
had his own show. Cause that doll baby is mine. But those shows could not go national. Uh, they could not go national because parts of the country, not just the South, but, or the former Dixie, parts of the country would not buy it, would not run the shows, and sponsors would not back the shows. Uh, so that by, uh, the late, by the late 50s, those attempts were over. Uh, and you saw African Americans really in subservient roles, servants, uh, so occasional criminals. Certainly the networks uh, and the advertisers who sponsored the show were racist, prejudiced, bigoted, you choose. Her coffee could be sweeter, but I'm not in the dumps, because every time she hugs me, it's like two extra lumps. Eddie Cantor had the temerity not only to hug Sammy Davis Jr. on television, but also Sammy was sweating and he handed him his, his handkerchief and there was an uproar. They actually you know, almost pulled Eddie Cantor off the air permanently because a Caucasian man had given a, a, a man of color a handkerchief to use. Yes, thank you, lucky stars. It's doing fine. Dinah Shore hugged or put her arm around Mahalia Jackson doing a duet on, on the Dinosaur Chevrolet show. And it started all those rumors again that Dinah Shore was, in fact, a mulatto. And lovers walked beneath those trees and birds found songs to sing. Racism in television was very real. I think the, the saddest time I had on television when John Butler uh, did a wonderful piece for um, Ed Sullivan's show. Um, I was dancing Willow Week for me or something like that. And, and I was going to dance with Glenn Tetley. And Glenn Tetley, I'd been dancing with him all the time as part of John Butler's company, that we did the, all those morning programs together. Nobody said anything about being of color or anything. We just did what we did. But I could not dance with Glenn because he was white. Now, John Butler was in Greenwood, Mississippi. And his two main ladies in his company were Mary Hinkson and myself. He was told he could not use me or we could not do this piece together. John was like thunderstruck. Unchain my heart. Variety performers kept on singing, <laughs> dancing, and waiting for change. It came in the mid-60s from a government and a nurse. You really did not get a change from African Americans playing either servants or musical performers until I Spy in the mid-60s, in which uh, uh, Bill Cosby was matched up with Robert Culp uh, playing government agents. He was the scholar. He started looking at how cool uh, Bill Cosby was uh, in I Spy, and, uh, and the fact that he was you know, particularly for then, he was treated as a, um, as somewhat of a, an equal. I thought one of the groundbreaking things about Bill Cosby's participation in I Spy was his portrayal as a, this brilliant Rhodes Scholar uh, individual that uh, was probably brighter than his partner and uh, was certainly a quantum leap from some of the characterizations that have been heretofore uh, given to black actors. And then a, little, a few years after that, you got Julia uh, with, with Diane Carroll playing a, a nurse. She was the perfect black woman. Black, white woman, they thought, I guess, during that time. But uh, Julia, was, you know, her show was great. And we needed to make that move, that change. Sort of bougie, but I liked it. I like bourgeois, along with some other things. It's, it's good, it's healthy. I thought it was like all the little shows that were on. It was very up, it was positive. She had a child, she was a single parent, right? And she was doing well. That was great for me. I enjoyed it. She couldn't do anything right. I mean, you know, black folks criticized her because uh, um, she was uh, too fancy or she spoke too well or she, you know, she wasn't really black, you know. And white folks criticized her because, you know, nobody lives like that or nobody acts like that or whatever. I mean, she just couldn't do anything right. And that was a lot of pressure on her, but thank God she did it, even for three seasons. This is 
is the future starting to happen. And you got Room 222, something that's often overlooked. But there you had uh, Lloyd Haynes playing a history teacher. I'm a teacher. I'm here to teach. But there's a regulation that says I can't teach this kid that he's got to go to Tyler. And that's wrong. Because I know Tyler. I'm from Tyler. And what they're doing there isn't teaching, it's controlling. And uh, Denise Nicholas playing a guidance counselor. I'm just doing what I have to do. Richie, you've been doing so great lately. The top 10% of your class. I sent a letter home to your folks to let them know how happy we were about it. And it came back. No such address. You do live in the school district, don't you? Sure. Liz McIntyre, all upper middle class. Touch all the bases, follow all the rules. Yes, sir, Mr. Coffin. We gonna kick Richie out. And the students were integrated and they dealt with issues of race. I'm taking attendance. What are you doing that for? Look, I don't want an argument. Are you here or not, Avery? Well, yeah, I'm here. Jason Allen. Get yourself together, baby. Ain't it enough you dress like the teacher? Jason Allen, here or not? <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Jason's here. Even the principal was Jewish. It's part of my civil service examination. It said, can you be a louse? I answered yes, so they made me a principal. They were going for ethnicity in that show. Ms. Johnson is here to dry the area behind her ears. She's going to spend the rest of this semester with you, student teaching. I hope it's a meaningful semester for both of us. <laughs> Just what you always wanted, right? Meaningful semester. It's very important that you and I establish good human relations. You're right. I know I have a lot of middle class hang-ups. I went to a segregated school. Oh, that's OK. So did I. So the breakthrough started to come in the late, in the late uh, 60s. Viewers caught a first glimpse of their favorite musical performers on the most popular variety shows of the era. Tonight you're mine, completely. The first Motown act that we ever had on Ed Sullivan was, of course, the Supremes. And um, then we just lined up. I mean, it was like a line of us going to the Ed Sullivan show. The reason we started to call the Supremes the girls at Motown was because the first time they were on there, Ed Sullivan introduced them. He said, and now we have uh, from Detroit, um, um, the girls. <laughs> he couldn't think of their name. <laughs> and the first time we were on there, he said, uh, now uh, from Detroit, from that Motown sound, we have uh, Smokey and uh, um, um, the Little Smokies. I think The Temptations did the Ed Sullivan Show around 1966, I believe. I turn the gray sky blue. When uh, knowledge of a black performer uh, was going to perform on Ed Sullivan or a show like that at the time, of course, people really congregated around the TV. There were people who didn't have a TV uh, they would go to someone's house and, and watch. And to show you how much a, of a, a part the television and black performers played at that time, we were booked to do a, a live show in Mississippi. And on that same night, with all the, powers the taped performance on Ed Sullivan was playing. No one came to that show <laughs> because they thought that the show would, would, would be a hoax because they said, how can they be on television and be here at this Coliseum at the same time? So the promoter 
literally lost his shirt because of that, simply because we were being shown on Ed Sullivan that same night. More than music made a mark on TV viewers in this decade of challenge and change. We will be free by any means necessary. Black power means black dignity. Just as surely as you are proud to be white, we're proud to be black. Black is beautiful, baby. It's pretty. It was civil rights. Serious documentaries about rural poverty, segregation, and the growing movement started appearing. News coverage of violent segregationist backlash burned images of fire hoses, dogs, and beatings into the American psyche. Thanks to TV, two black male figures rushed to the forefront of American minds. Dr. Martin Luther King was seen as saintly, leading marches in Selma, Birmingham, and Montgomery. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Conversely, the stance and religion of Malcolm X struck fear in the hearts of the viewers. And it goes back to growing up in Iowa. I would say that, for me, the, the national coverage of the civil rights movement in the early 60s was in many ways that in the print media, how I as a child participated. I would say it was different for my parents because I can remember, for instance, my father being photographed picketing a Greyhound bus station. But as a child, I lived the civil rights movement through those television images. I grew up in Winston-Salem, and you know, 30 miles away was Greensboro, where the Woolworth sit-ins happened. And there was a lot of activity going on down south. Um, and my parents were trying to help me understand that, and at the same time shelter me from the types of things that little black girls had to go through in the 60s. And I think the television was the thing that let us know that in our struggle to be equal, that we weren't alone that that television was a way of bringing the entire nation and the world into my living room and letting me know that I counted, that there were people out there fighting for my rights. And that made me, at least, it made me as a, in a very young age realize the power that television had, the images that, 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 that it makes on, on lives and impressions, the power that it gives a little girl from North Carolina to believe that there's a nation out there believing that you're equal too. And you know something, little girl? There may not be any black anchor women on TV today, but you're gonna be one. And that kind of image, that let me know the power of that medium. And that's why I love television. By the 70s, the entire world was beginning to count on television for a significant part of its entertainment. America fell in love with two very funny black men as the 70s began. And soon, Red Fox and Flip Wilson were standing on top of the world. Flip Wilson is entertaining. Yeah. Flip Wilson, when I saw him do Geraldine, I hooped. Ho there was no cussing, but just that character and the nerve of this man to dress in, as we know today, drag and be comfortable with it and be hilarious. It was brilliant. See, back then, we didn't know any better. At least I didn't. I didn't know, but I was like, Flip, is that a man? That's, that's Flip Wilson. How brilliant was that? See, back then, I think maybe Black Commons looked at him and said, can you believe he is putting this damn dress on? But then when they saw his ratings and the dollar signs, oh, putting a dress on is not so bad. I liked the Flip Wilson show, and the reason why I liked it is because, you know, it was this, this black man on TV who was in actually in control of his own show and, and not just to be and when you're in control of your own you tend to look out for your folks you know he brought in the black artists to be a part of his show you know and that was wonderful you know this was I saw a power a sense of power and a sense of control in Flip and, and his production. The funniest person ever on television I think was Rick Fox. He was very honest. 
And I think if they allowed him to cuss, he would have. Just his facial expressions. He didn't even have to open his mouth. And that's what makes a great comedian without saying a word. And you still have people just crying. He was the funniest person on television. <laughs> been a nerve shattering experience for me, so I'd like to go home. Richard Pryor and I got our writers' guild cards together, writing for Sanford and Son. And Richard couldn't take the, the grind of every day, so he quit. So I stayed on. But a black comedy writer was something that was on the moon, that was unheard of. They had mostly white men who grew up with black people, who knew black people, writing for black shows. I, w I would always hear that expression. It would always bother me. It would hurt my ears. Because every script I ever wrote for Sanford and Son, Red Fox and those black actors, the minute they picked that script up, they knew I had, they knew I had written it. I grew up with Red Fox, so uh, I was a big fan of his. And he, and he loved Richard, and Richard Pryor loved him. So it was like family. It was easy. Being black in entertainment means being part of a very small family, inside an often hostile larger world. But African-American performers today, from the celebrated to the unknown, understand with each step they take, they stand on the shoulders of those who came before them. It's so vital that there were so many nameless and faceless individuals who really, really paid ferocious dues for those who we came to know, like the James Edwards in Home of the Brave, Mr. Sidney Poitier in No Way Out, uh, of course, Ethel Waters and Louise Beavers and Mr. Ernest Whitman, Freddie Washington, Lawrence Kreiner, Alex Lovejoy, many of the Lafayette players. Uh, these individuals were so germane to our success, and they carried us through, and they took the parts that they had no option to take because they wanted to work, they were artists, and they paid dues. And people like to go back and reference Lincoln Perry, Mr. Step and Fetch It, which was a character, not the man. People like to reference him as some sort of pejorative notion. But we are not that far removed with a lot of the young people in what they are doing today. I mean, we used to have a time, certainly during the time of when my early maturation in the 70s, and we would look at variety shows, and we would see Mr. Sammy Davis Jr., we would see Diane Carroll, we'd see Leslie Uggams, Mr. Portier, Mr. Belafonte, we'd see Pearl Bailey, we'd see all Lena Horne, these great artists, and every single time they hit the stage, we were proud because they brought such a usable consciousness and a magnificent sense of dignity and huge artistry to the moment that we were all proud and we were made better each time they took the stage. I would say Ruby Dee, Ozzie Davis, Cicely Tyson, um, Sidney Poitier, Harry Belafonte, um, you know, just all these really incredible people that uh, without them, we probably would not be here um, to, you know, go through all the hard knocks and, and the uh, struggles that they had to endure um, for me to be here, I know that. The public doesn't get that, uh, that there is uh, sort, of, sort of an unspoken fraternity and camaraderie that goes along with being in this business that exists. They see us in com competition a lot because the business is structured that way. You have charts that who's the number one, who's this, who's that, who's best box office, who's this. And it looks as if it is somewhat competitive. And on a certain level, I guess that it is. But on a much deeper level, as artists, we all share a certain kind of uh, understanding about what we're going through, and particularly as African-American artists, uh, that we are part of something that is bigger than just the work that we're doing, and uh, we try to support each other. It takes, it takes an entire community to protect and nurture this thing called entertainment and called uh, images of us. The first years of television in black paralleled the growth of the nation. Mammy antics and buffoonery changed into civil rights and strong looks at history. But television had to wait many more years for equal opportunity, laughter, and tears.
I wave them from side to side. Come on. 